All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining Wu University's next and exciting topic, genetics and eye care. This is something that we've been wanting to present on, and I think we have found the absolute perfect people to talk about genetics and eye care tonight, Dr. John Gellies and Dr. Melissa Barnett. I am your host this evening, Dr. Stephanie Wu. I am the founder of Wu University. Just want to say thank you to Avellino for supporting this event with an unrestricted educational grant. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this evening. Uh, first, Dr. Melissa Barnett. Dr. Barnett is a principal optometrist at the University of California, Davis in Sacramento and Davis, California. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomate of the American Board of Certification in Medical Optometry, a fellow and global ambassador of BCLA, and she is a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society. She's authored an amazing book that you should all read if you have any interest in scleral lenses called Contemporary Scleral Lenses Theory and Application. And she was granted the most influential women in optical from Vision Monday in 2019. Next is Dr. John Gellies. Dr. Gellies is the director of the Specialty Contact Lens Division of the Cornea and Laser Eye Institute and the CLEI Center for Keratoconus in Teaneck, New Jersey. He is an assistant clinical professor at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Science and an adjunct clinical professor at the State University of New York College of Optometry, Illinois College of Optometry, and Nuenco. Uh, not only are Dr. Barnett and Dr. Gellies incredibly smart and just some of the best leaders in eye care today, they're also dear friends of mine, and it's a it's a it's an honor and a pleasure for them to be on Wu University this evening. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Barnett and Dr. Gellies. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you all for coming to this talk tonight. And I will speak for John and myself. We had a ton of fun um, coming up with all sorts of information that we'd like to share with you. We're very fortunate to help grow our wonderful profession and working with many companies. So John, when was the last time you learned about genetics? Right. So like a lot of people, uh, you know, in... Uh on tonight, probably uh, college and very much your first year of, uh, of optometry school. For me, I had my my last uh, thesis paper on genetics in my last year of uh, college. So <laughs> it's uh, it's been a little while, but uh, how about you? <laughs> it's been a very long time. And so I think for a lot of people, it's been quite a while since we learned about genetics, since we really thought about genetics. But this is a really exciting time to be just discovering genetics and how it works in eye care. And so we're going to share some fun facts, lots and lots of fun facts about genetics. And hopefully you'll think a little bit differently after this lecture. So first of all, why in the world should we even care about genetic testing? Uh, let's just start with a patient, right? A patient who comes in, I'll, I'll tell you about a patient I'm seeing tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. I've seen him forever. And he's a 43 year old male who has keratoconus. He also has MS, which is just so sad. But, and he is a, the primary caregiver for his three sons. And so we talked about keratoconus and how that can have his, his children might be at risk for keratoconus and what can we do about it? Now we've talked about this for many, many years and I'm gonna keep you hanging for just a little bit because we're gonna talk later in this lecture and I'm gonna tell you what I told that patient and what we're doing next, so stay tuned. We know that DNA is central to all life on earth and genetics is so incredibly important. So just go back to whenever you learned about genetics all those years ago, or for some of you who might be more recent grads, maybe it's more fresh than it was for us. But we know that all human traits and disease have a genetic component. So it's really important for the diagnosis and treatment of all sorts of different conditions. 
And, you know, we can go back. I mean, I think in junior high, wasn't it? Like we first started learning about genetics and we could learn that the role of genes, of behavior and the environment, it's really important for collecting data and applying this information. I'll tell you with, I have two children, two boys, they're 12 and 14. And I'm just thinking about, you know, the genetic component and the environmental component of so many different characteristics. And I'm sure that many of you are as well who have children or are interested in having children. But genetic testing is commonplace. It's all over the place. It actually one in five people in the US has had a genetic test of some sort. And the market for genetic testing is booming. So if you look at the genetic testing market in the US in 2020 and then 2027, it's going to increase 11.5%. That's absolutely huge. And I just have some pictures here of all the different sort of genetic tests that you could get. And a recent article that came out in Consumer Reports about you know, read this before you buy a genetic test. If any of you have searched, and, and we searched recently for this lecture, just about genetic testing in general, there are all sorts of different conflicting, I would say, information out there. This test is definitely the best. It's going to tell you the most information. No, this test is definitely the best. It's going to tell you more information than that test. And, you know, it goes on and on and on. You can read about genetic tests for years and years and years. But the market is huge and how, and we're going to talk how this applies to eye care. So you just wanted to kind of get a baseline of, you know, where we are now, but why, why would you even be interested? I wish we could do like a show of hands, right? Is it, is it true here? One in five of you have actually had a genetic test, but why would you be interested? And it, it's interesting to see if there's a genetic condition that runs in your family. Of course, we will get to eye-related conditions in just a moment, uh, but many times during and before pregnancy or during pregnancy, uh, you'll have a genetic condition. And I know that when I was pregnant and when we looked at family history, there actually were some concerns. Fortunately, everything is fine and there are no conditions for my children, but I actually did have genetic testing um, when I was pregnant. So that was kind of interesting, a little bit scary, I'll be honest with you at that point in time. But fortunately, all is well and nothing came of it. And genetic testing can be really helpful if your child has any symptoms or a condition, or if the parent has something that they're worried about passing on to the child, and for cancer too, and prevention. And I think it's so interesting when we're talking about just general health care here, uh, diabetes and hypertension, and not even you know eye-related things, but things that we can find in the eye. And we'll talk more about all of the eye-related conditions in a moment, but this can really help uh, customize treatment if we know the genetic history. Perfect. So going way back, John. Yeah, so if we go kind of back to the beginning, we can look at Mendel as being kind of the father of modern genetics. And, uh, you know, really what his discovery was, was looking at pea plants and kind of coming up with the concept of the transfer principle. So we all know Punnett squares, right? He was really the originator of the Punnett squares. His initial idea was if I take a pea plant that's short, a pea plant that's tall, if we have those, uh, those uh, gen uh, genetic uh, materials run together, we should get all medium level or uh, medium height pea plants. Well, what he found was out of it, we got three tall pea plants and one short, right? So what he coined was the transfer principle. So the concept of a dominant and a recessive trait in an individual. Later on, we come to... Uh, uh, Frederick here, who really was the first to isolate nuclein, which is DNA. Um, what he found was by taking bandages uh, that had uh, you know, white pus. cells from pus, <laughs> we'll just say it's pus, uh, by uh, analyzing pus, basically what he was finding was that there was a unique ratio of phosphorus to nitrogen, which is telling us basically about our base pairs, right? Our nucleotides that uh, make up our our DNA. And as we get to the 1900s, 
really genetics had kind of fallen out of favor until we get to the early 1900s in which they kind of rediscover Mendel's work and then they start growing the field of genetics starting in the 1900s. So when we get to 1928, uh, uh, Griffith really does a, a remarkable experiment that really tells us about uh, transference and hereditable uh, transference of uh, genetic information. So what he does is he takes a, a, a streptococcal pneumonia, so basically uh, what's going to cause pneumonia, uh, the bacteria there, and what he does is he takes two different strains of it. You have one with smooth cells and one with rough cells, basically a, uh, a uh, envelope uh, on the cells to protect them um, as they go into the body, which makes them more virulent, right? So he injects those into a mice, the smooth cells kill the mice. The rough cells do not, the mice lives. So what he then does is he takes the smooth cells and heat treats them. By heat treating the uh, smooth cells, he ruptures the cell membrane, which then makes the, uh, the cells basically dead. He injects those into the mice, the mice lives, right? What he then does is he mixes the rough cells with the dead uh, smooth cells and he injects that into the mice the mouse dies. So why does that happen? Well, he says, well, it's a transference of the genetic information. Now he's not sure what exactly that means or what it is, but he knows that there's some sort of transference that's happening there, whether it's the proteins or the enzymes or the DNA itself. So as we go forward into uh, 1931, 1936, um, we have two very, very important studies that happen here. And if we give it a click, you'll see this uh, you know, transference, again, if we go back to the, uh, you know, Punnett squares and transferring of uh, genetic data, what we're looking at in this is you have Creighton and McClintock that are using corn or maize to, uh, you know, show this uh, transference of genetic data. And then you have Stern and Doan who are using uh, Drosophila or, for, or fruit flies to show this sort of uh, chromosomal uh, interaction. And what we're seeing is that these allelic uh, combinations are physically exchanged by the chromosomes during this. So we're noticing that chromosomes are the basis of these genetics. So this is really starting to predispose what we may have is the genetic or rather the DNA structure that'll come out later. Uh, now in 1944, uh, Avery, uh, McCarty and McLeod uh, go ahead and they revisit Griffith's work and they go, well, why is this happening, right? There's got to be some reason why, uh, what, you know, what, what is the concept of the transference? What's being transferred here? So what they did was they started using various different solutes to go ahead and wipe away the proteins and the enzymes and test uh, by various different injections into mice. What is it that's actually left over? What component of this, uh, the protein, the DNA, or the enzymes is actually transferring the data, which is killing these mice? And what they find is that by wiping away the proteins and the enzymes, it's the DNA that's transferring this. Um, so as we continue forward, what we start to have is the basically the Legos of life. We start figuring this out, right? So you have uh, Chargoff who really figures out that DNA is made out of base pairs, right? We're finding that there is an equal amount of those various different nucleotides and that the ratio is varied by the species, right? So a human has a different ratio than, you know, a cat versus a mouse versus fruit flies, whatever. Um, what we then find is that you have uh, Franklin, Willis, and Gosling, and they come up with the structure. Uh, specifically, Franklin is the one who is mostly or should be mostly credited with this, uh, which is using the X-ray diffraction studies to find the, uh, the uh, helical nature of uh, the DNA uh, uh, shape. What we then have is Watson and Crick who kind of put the whole thing together to say, you know, and build on the work of everybody else to say, okay, well, here is the definite molecular structure of DNA. Um, and as we move forward from there, you have, you know, the, the more important, well, not more important, but the, the, an important portion of this, which is noticing that uh, restriction enzymes exist. So Amber, Smith, Nathans, these guys are really discovering the cleave factor, right? And how resi uh, restriction enzymes really cut DNA into fragments and how that can be used to the advantage of a cell. And that is the beginning of the foreshadowing of genetic engineering and genetic targeted genetic treatments. 
Um, and as we continue to move forward through this, you know, really what we're looking at is in the 1970s, we're starting to figure out that we can sequence DNA, right? But sequencing DNA in the 1970s is a long and arduous process. We're sitting there going, oh God, this is gonna take forever to get the DNA out of one individual. It's so fragile. You know, if we ruin the sample, gosh, we gotta go back and get more. Well, 1983, Mullins's group develops a PCR, which is unbelievably game-changing. Essentially what this is, is it's a technique to amplify the amount of DNA that you have, right? So if you have one strand of DNA, you can now make this into millions of strands of DNA through a process of thermocycling. So essentially what you're doing is you're denaturing the DNA into a single strand. You're using this polymerase to essentially complete the strand. So you have one strand, you break it into two. You have now two strands that are built by the uh, polymerase you reheat those, they denature into single strands. So now you have four single strands, you hit them with the polymerase, now you have four DNA, uh, you know, uh, helixes there. You now can do that over and over and over. You're going, you know, four to six to, or excuse me, four to eight to 16 to 32 to 64. You know, you just keep building the amount of DNA that you can work with. So uh, th this is a incredible jump forward. And then as we continue forward into this, we now have the ability to start, you know, we have all the techniques in place to be able to take on a giant project. And that is in the form of the human genome project, right? The idea of this is that we are going to map the human genome, right? Well, part of the thought process at this time is, okay, we're gonna map the genome and then we're gonna end human disease, right? Well, the reality of that is it's a lot more complicated than we all thought. Um, so the Human Genome Project starts in uh, 1990, and it wraps up in 2003 once we've completed the human genome sequencing, right? Well, in 2002, uh, the International HapMap Project starts, and this is there to ID genetic variations that cause disease based on haploid genome mapping. Now, in 2007, we have about 3.1 million variations in the human genome <laughs> that have been identified. So this is just massive amounts of work. And then in 2008, we start the uh, 1000 Genomes Project, which is the idea of creating a genetically, or rather a ethnically diverse catalog of genetic variations. And in 2015, they kind of wrap this process up but does that mean victory? Do we now know everything about the human genome? No, we are still far from knowing everything. <laughs> that was a, a great overview, John. And if you, I uh, found some resources if you're interested for, it's true, um, listen to some Nobel Prize lectures. You can actually find them online about all of the, or some of the people that you just talked about. So it's kind of interesting um, there as well. So we know just kind of, the, I mean, the Human Genome Project, that was such huge news and it still is absolutely fascinating. There's so much we know and there is also so much we don't know at this point in time, but just kind of going back to the basics, we know that the genome is the entire sequence and a genotype is in an individual's complete DNA makeup. I kind of like this top image here that shows that the genes are specific DNA nucleotide sequences and you have your cells and then your nucleus, your chromosome and DNA. And a phenotype of course is in an individual or a specific person's physical manifestations. Now, of course, going way, way back, remember the DNA and the RNA, we're not gonna go over everything because we have to get to the really fun stuff, which is the I-related genetics, right? That's the super fun stuff. But we know that DNA is double-stranded, RNA is single-stranded, DNA is much longer than RNA, and an entire chromosome is one molecule of DNA. So lots of really interesting information here. Just going back to the basics of DNA with the nucleotides and then going on to RNA. And you know, once you all see this, it might come up, oh yes, I remember learning about all of this many, many years ago. And here's just a little bit of a refresher. 
Now, RNA, I feel like is so huge uh, with COVID. And so it's all over the news. And so we've been talking a lot about RNA. We've also been talking about messenger RNA. So that single stranded RNA molecule that's complementary to a DNA strand of a gene. Uh, we've been talking about transfer RNA just the type of RNA molecule that helps decode the mRNA into a protein. And then of course we have the ribosomal RNA, which is the type of non-coding RNA and which is essential to all cells. I like pictures quite a bit. And so here you can see all the different types of pictures of RNA, but we've been talking about RNA more in the past one year than we probably ever had before. Now, we know that <laughs> mutations in a gene can cause all sorts of diseases. And so just kind of keeping it practical, if it's something is monogenic, a single gene mutation uh, can lead to disease and it can be sort of positive. It can be positive or negative. So examples here, are real life examples are cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia versus polygenic where multiple gene mutations or variants are correlated with disease. And here, this is where we're talking about obesity and diabetes and all sorts of heart diseases. So we're looking at the risk analysis. And are we saying, you know, we have one person, are they more at risk for a certain condition than another condition? Of course, this all plays in when we talk about the ocular surface and even the back of the eye. We do have some retina in this lecture. It's shocking, you know. We had to, we, you'll see some pictures of, you know, retinal disorders as well. But that risk analysis is really important when we're talking to our patients. For example, something like keratoconus. We're going to talk to them about their risk for the condition. And of course, we can, we do talk about uh, diabetes all the time with during an eye exam as well. During a dilated exam, we're always looking for diabetes. We're looking for hypertensive retinopathy. This is something that we do day to day with all of our patients. Perfect. So, you know, there are various different types or methods of genetic testing that you can do. Right. If we're looking for a Mendelian disease or rather a, a monogenic disease, we really only need to run a test on that short length or that just single gene. Right. We don't need to run their entire genome to know whether or not they have that disease. We just need to look at that single area. Right. So the idea here is to just identify that. And this is really best used when there's a known mutation in the family. Right. We know that somebody in the family has this we want to test something else for it, right? Whereas you have panel genetics, which is essentially running, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so the panel genetic does you have a sip of water. Um, so for example, like a low muscle tone, short stature, I know um, of a bunch of people growing up that were, that were evaluated for short stature and then were given intervention um, as children. And when there is a certain type of cancer, such as breast cancer, a panel genetic test can be used to detect for that. So there are also chromosomal genetic tests, uh, which analyze the whole entire chromosome or long lengths of DNA, and there can determine if there are any large genetic changes uh, for a specific condition. There are also biochemical genetic tests as well that can study proteins and abnormalities can indicate changes to the DNA. So we just want you to be aware that there are different methods for genetic testing. Thank you. <laughs> You're back. Right, now, now we're, we should be good. So okay. you know, when we look at the types of applications of genetic testing, you know, one of them is carrier testing. This is the one that a lot of us are very commonly aware of. You know, essentially what we're doing is we're identifying if a person with one copy of a gene uh, that may get, uh, you, you know, uh, have a parental planning with another individual, if two copies of that gene exist, uh, we would cause the genetic disorder. So a very, you know, commonly known one in this is tax, right? Um, so we want to look for individuals who have a family history of the genetic order or are part of a ethnic group that may have an increased genetic risk for that disease. And what we're looking for is, you know, do we have a carrier uh, mother or father 
uh, with a, uh, a, you know, a carrier partner. And that will show us the risk of having a child uh, with that disease. Um, now, if we move forward to the next one, another one, you know, a lot of these revolve around pregnancy and the, the idea of family planning, right? Um, when we look at kind of the three areas of testing that go into this, you know, we have two that are, uh, you know, well, kind of throughout the process here, we have, uh, you know, pre-implantation. So if we're doing in vitro therapy, um, what we're doing is we're looking at the cells that are, that are present. There are kind of two ways of looking at this. Uh, there's a non-invasive uh, DNA sampling, and then there is a, a biopsy form that we can do. And what we do with that <clears throat> is we do a whole genomic uh, uh, amplification. And based on uh, NGS, we then go ahead and decide whether or not we have a viable, um, you know, or a, uh, a cell that would be uh, you know, harboring a type of genetic uh, uh, mutation that we find undesirable, um, or uh, we find a uh, an individual that uh, you know has a nice, healthy um, uh, embryo uh, for us to implant. Right. So we want to go ahead. We'll discard the ones that have genetic defects, and then go ahead and keep the uh, the, the healthy ones. Um, the other one is uh, prenatal uh, genetic testing. So in this case, we're looking at fetal dreams or uh, chromosomes before birth. So in these ways, we're doing, uh, you know, either uh, transcervical uh, methods of uh, removing some of that uh, placental or rather amniotic fluid. Um, we're also looking through, you know, transendominal uh, methods. Um, and what we're doing is we're looking at those genes from, uh, from that point. And then there's newborn screening. So this is kind of the heel prick uh, testing that we do to uh, rule out conditions like uh, congenital hypothyroidism, uh, things that would uh, be very detrimental uh, to, to the child growing up. Uh, the other ones that we look at are for forensic testing. We're all very familiar with the use cases of DNA to identify individuals for legal purposes. So DNA fingerprinting. So if we look, you know, at the first criminal conviction that was based on DNA evidence, this comes in 1988. Uh, this is Colin uh, Pitchfork, who was uh, put away for a uh, double rape murder uh, in the UK. Um, and in the first case, this actually exonerates a 17 year old uh, uh, mentally disabled uh, individual who had confessed uh, to these, uh, you know, to these crimes. So this is showing us that this is really powerful uh, in its ability to identify individuals. But then it goes on to be popularized in the media. We know that uh, if we give uh, you know a couple of clicks here, we'll give a nod to a special uh, special special victims unit. And uh, this is my favorite one from it, which is you know tick DNA has been cataloged down to the county, which is actually true. It actually has been, <laughs> uh, but it's also been popularized in talk shows such as, uh, you know, Maury here with his, uh, his uh, little famous line there, the DNA says that was a lie. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we're, we're all very familiar with these kind of forensic use cases. And if we go further forward into uh, the, the newer ways of this, you know, we have uh, predictive or pre-symptomatic testing that's being popularized right now, which is to detect, uh, you know, mutations associated with disorders that uh, may happen, you know, later on in your life, right? So the use case may be that uh, you have a family member with a genetic disorder. You don't have this disorder at the time of testing, but you want to know, do you have risk factors for that genetic disorder? Um, this is very uh, common individuals who have, uh, you know, family histories of various different types of cancers, um, uh, breast cancer being one of the most uh, commonly uh, uh, tested in this. And, you know, in some individuals, this will act as, you know, preemptive care and behavioral change for individuals. So in my case, with my family's history of heart disease, uh, you know, I have decided that I am no longer going to be eating cheeseburgers every two nights. I'm going to cut that down to once a week. Uh, <laughs> and I'm also going to exercise a lot more. So, um, you know, that, that's how you can use these, uh, you know, predictive and pre-symptomatic testing. Now, if we move forward to the next one, this is diagnostic testing. So for those individuals where we suspect that there is a disease present and we want confirmation of that disease being present. 
So what we have here is uh, Ellis, Danvers, uh, Ellis Danvers, uh syndrome and Marfan syndrome, right? So obviously, you know, th these sorts of things are, can be uh, symptoms that get diagnosed later in life at any, you know, particular time when somebody says, oh, you know, I found this, you know, you may have this disease and we should test you for that, right? And this can influence, uh, you know, a person's choices in their lifetime. So, you know, obviously, if we take a quick click here, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have our ED, which is associated with, uh, you know, uh, ectopic lenses, right? So, and uh, high myopia, these individuals experience retinal detachments. So obviously, these are things that you are going to see in your chair, right? If we go to, uh, you know, Marfman's and we go ahead and we click on this, you know, keratoconus associated with Marfman. So we have these, uh, uh, these sorts of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, genetic uh, predispositions for these diseases. And, uh, it, you know, you would diagnostically test for these individuals to find those genetic uh, 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 correlations. And retinal yeah. detachment in Marfan's too, you know, we, we see that quite a bit. So now getting to the fun stuff, right? The applications in eye care. So, there, you know, we work a lot in the front of the eye, but we did want to include some of the back of the eye and such as inherited retinal dystrophies. So all sorts of things, so such as retinitis pigmentosa, Leber's congenital amaurosis, which is coming up right next. And the, there are multifactorial conditions like age-related macular degeneration. So really interesting, just diving into the research on retinal conditions. And there, there is testing that is being done currently for retinal conditions, but more than 200 genes are known to cause inherited retinal dystrophies. I did not know that until I did this research. And these can disrupt the development, function, and survival of the rod and cone photoreceptors and the RPE cells. Oh my so, God, I just realized that I said, so Marfan's with the, uh, with the atomic lens and the, uh, the retinal elongation and the retinal detachments, uh, ED with the KC. Sorry about that. <laughs> I just realized that that's what I said. Sorry. Uh, no problem. <laughs> With, with, with leafers, there can be a family history of a congenital retinal dystrophy and really severe vision loss uh, very early in life. Uh, there can be blindness at one year of age. Other things that you might see are nystagmus or really reduced vision, photophobia, high hyperopia as well. And it's the most severe retinal dystrophy. Now, glaucoma, this is kind of an exciting time in glaucoma. I can't believe I'm actually saying that. Um, but we know the severity of glaucoma and with myopia and the current epidemic, how much glaucoma we're actually seeing in, in our clinics and how much we will see moving forward as well. We know that glaucoma is a multifactorial condition. It's very complex. There can be all sorts of different presentations. We see a lot of children actually who present with glaucoma and really severe glaucoma. And of course, very elderly patients have glaucoma as well. We know that there are ethnic disparities, there are geographic disparities. And this article actually looked at all of the genes associated with different types of glaucoma. So in primary open angle glaucoma, I will not read all of the genes to you, but you can see all of the different genes in this one study. And the next study is looking at, or this is the same study looking at angle closure glaucoma. There are also genes associated there and exfoliative glaucoma as well. So a kind of quote that I like from this study is that despite tremendous progress, there are major gaps that remain in resolving the genetic architecture for the various glaucoma subtypes across ancestries. Now move on to February, 2021, and a different study that came out with 44 new genetic variants associated with glaucoma. Now this study actually made the news. It was in US uh, news, you know, like here is information about glaucoma. That's pretty huge, I think. Um, and this was really a, a big one that, that came out. So this study was a large multi-ethnic meta-analysis of genome-wide association studies 
And the goal was really to identify risk loci in all of these different cases. And there were controls in the study as well. So that's where the 44 previously unreported loci were found, which is pretty amazing. And 83 loci that were previously known were also confirmed from this study. And looking again, the same study that at different ethnicities, in European ethnicities, Asian, African, there were differences there. And it supports some of the previous studies that shows several genes that are common in primary open ankle glaucoma. So what can we do with this information? Hopefully the goal is to create specific drugs and specific formulations of compounds that can target primary open angle glaucoma and target the risk genes that can be candidates for potential glaucoma therapy. So just think about this. I mean, years to come, we can say, oh, here's your genetic information for glaucoma. And this is exactly how we can help you. And I have a lot of patients with glaucoma. I'm sure you do too, John. And just think about how we can create this targeted therapy for each one of our patients across a variety of conditions to really improve their quality of life. Uh, absolutely. You know, when we start to think about targeted genetic condition or, you know, treatments, I, I think it's just promising, very exciting area. You know, we've been waiting for it for some time, but I think we're starting to get to, you know, the, the points where this is actually going to become a reality here pretty quick. And uh, eye care is going to be one of the first to, to benefit from it. So if we look at uh, Fabry disease, this is an X-linked disease. Uh, really what you're looking at is the GLA gene, which is uh, coding for a lack of uh, alpha galactosine uh, A, which is essentially breaking down your uh, glycosphingolipids. And as we have a, a lack of that enzyme, we get a buildup of those, uh, of those lipids in the lysosomes of the body. Um, now, the way to treat this disease is by enzyme therapy, but what you can see in eye care is you're going to see these corneal varicella, so that you can see these little granular sort of deposits within the cornea, and that is a very uh, pathognomonic sort of uh, method of uh, diagnosis of this individual. This individual actually had no idea that they had that disease. Uh, they had all sorts of neuropathies, which are uh, associated with the uh, Fabry disease. Um, and uh, the typical sort of rash appearance that you can get with it, um, all those sorts of things, but it had never been uh, actually to a doctor to have those things addressed until we had said, hey, it looks like you have this. And he goes, oh, okay. I, you know, I was noticing all these things over the years. I just thought it was kind of, you know, what happened to me. And I was like, oh, okay, let's get you worked up. <laughs> so, yeah. Now we get to get go to keratoconus. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Thank you all. <laughs> we made it to keratoconus. Excellent. So we know that family history is really important in keratoconus. So let me tell you um, more about the patient story that I that I started with at the beginning. So the 43-year-old a man with keratoconus and MS, who's the primary caregiver for his three kids. So what did I talk to him about uh, years ago, many years ago? I talked to him about screening his children, right? It's really important to screen all family members of patients who have keratoconus. And we have a lot of patients who have keratoconus. Now we can also screen, you know, we have all this fancy instrumentation. We can check corneal topography, corneal tomography, but we can also screen our patients looking for changes in astigmatism, asymmetry between the eyes, checking retinoscopy, scissors reflex. I love doing that. And also obviously looking at the cornea. So for this one specific patient, I did talk to him about genetic testing, um, which he is extremely excited about for his three children, which at this time have no clinical signs of keratoconus. So I'll keep you posted in our next lecture with the results of uh, those tests. But research in keratoconus and genetics over the last 15 years has really blossomed and bloomed. There's so much more information. I think we could have an entire lecture only on keratoconus and genetics, or maybe that's the lecture you're doing tomorrow, John, but <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, I, we're just, you know, diving into the literature and there's so much to share. Um, 
but I, I think that's important to know to the audience that there is so much to share because I remember looking even 10 years ago and there, we did not have as much information. There was very little information and now there's a lot of information. So the increase in the number of genes involved are, it has expanded and there is better and stronger evidence for the genetic components of keratoconus. So just kind of touching on a few uh, studies here because there are so many. Obviously we know that keratoconus does have a genetic component and we want to identify specific variants that affect those underlying proteins in our patients with keratoconus. So this study looked at 34 candidate genes for keratoconus. This study was done in Belgium, France, and Italy, and it looked at uh, 745 patients with keratoconus and 810 ethnically matched controls. And this is just fascinating. We could go over all of these studies, but we're not going to um, for the sake of time. Uh, but just this is a great article if you're interested in just getting all of the information in one, but getting kind of to the bottom line here, the studies do identify that there is conclusive genetic evidence that there are more than two dozen genes that are susceptible. So really interesting. So when your patient at getting it, you know, practical real life. So if your patients say, you know, I have keratoconus, is, is my child at risk? We can answer and we can use these studies and this information to say, yes, there's definitely a genetic component. So there's so much information that we didn't have a years ago. So don't you love this picture, John? <laughs> So getting back to, you know, the, the earlier um, note that um, ED is associated with keratoconus, these are, uh, this is a different study showing all of the different genes that confirmed that ED and keratoconus are actually linked because it's, it's known that they're kind of associated, but the genes are actually some of the same genes that are linked in the two conditions. So it shows a genetic etiology between the two conditions, which is kind of fascinating. We also need to remember our patients who have like Down syndrome to screen them uh, for keratoconus and, and we need to look at sleep apnea and keratoconus. I mean, there are many different things, but kind of interesting that we do have specific genetic information for the different studies. Now, this was a different study looking at corneal neovascularization, which we tend to see in contact lens wearers, especially. And this study looks at um, different methods for uh, gene therapy for reducing corneal neovascularization and viral um, vectors are actually efficient to reduce corneal neovascularization in rats. So kind of another really interesting uh, study here. And microbial keratitis, this one, John, I think is really interesting. Why don't you tell us about this one? Yeah, this one is fascinating. So Loretta yeah. has proposed this idea and you know it, it has been an idea that's been really, really fascinating and kind of ties into the COVID situation as well. Uh, yeah. Microbial keratitis, there has to be a genetic component to why some individuals uh, get these just horrendous, you know, uh, infections, whereas other individuals who may abuse a contact lens wear it for, you know, months straight and not have any problems, right? So it may be the same sort of thing as to why some individuals who do get, um, who do get, uh, you know, COVID-19 uh, have a, you know, extreme, extreme, uh, you know, uh, illness that happens because of their infection versus an individual who has virtually, you know, no symptoms at all. Um, so is there a genetic component to this? And, uh, you know, she's proposed this, there's been a couple of different studies that have looked at this, but nothing that's been able to find statistical significance in anything. In genetic studies, you need a, mi you know, to the minus nine uh, decimal point in your statistical significance. So instead of your, you know, 0 0.05, you need much more statistical significance to be able to say that. So um, th there's, there's a lot of work to be done in the area, but it could be really, really cool. Um, 
So let's get into some clinical genetic testing and eye care. Uh, and I'll try to motor through this pretty quickly so that we, we uh, can finish up here on time. But, you know, when are you going to order uh, genetic testing uh, in your clinic? Right now, there's really only one, uh, you know, tool that, you know, currently I, I'm and Melissa are interested in because it affects the cornea, um, which is uh, using a, a test uh, for looking at corneal diseases, uh, specifically primary uh, corneal aptasia or keratoconus and looking at corneal dystrophies, right? So when are you going to use these? Well, when you have questionable findings, like the topography on the left here and the cornea, the stromal sort of uh, stellate looking uh, uh, opacities, you know, we want to know, is that a corneal dystrophy? Is that, you know, individual at high risk for keratoconus in that topography? We also want to look at this on patients who may undergo corneal-based treatment therapies. So an individual who may undergo a corneal refractive surgery like LASIK or PRK or a SMILE procedure, or in our cases, for those individuals who are going to be performing orthokeratology, uh, like the new FDA approved or orthokeratology for myopia control, mm -hmm. you know, we want to know, is this individual who has this questionable finding on their cornea at risk for keratoconus before I manipulate their anterior surface uh, of their cornea and eliminate my best diagnostic factor based on physical characteristics. So it's a very important thing to have. And then obviously, if you have a patient with keratoconus who has children, it's important to have their children screened so that you can know what their risk level is. Uh, and then we can you know, decide that we're gonna go ahead and order those, those tests. And then we may find that we follow up on those individuals much more frequently than we would have otherwise if they come back with a higher risk. So, um, and just um, to, to chime in here a little bit, a patient who has 2020 vision, but it's not a crisp and clear 2020 vision, and also a patient who's changing prescriptions often. So, oftentimes we will see these patients after they've been changing glasses and contacts and the prescription has changed, then I'm thinking, well, is this a corneal ectasia, corneal dystrophy, or is this just a patient getting more myopic, but especially if there's a change in astigmatism, I want to evaluate further and consider this genetic testing. Yes, yes. Now, th this specific genetic test is done by a buccal swab, essentially a cheek swab. Um, the way that you're going to do this is you're going to have a vial of sample suspension solution and a sterile swab. Now, the sterile swab, you don't want to touch that with your fingers. Uh, that swab really only needs to be picking up cells from the inside of the cheek, not from your fingertips, okay? Uh, the procedure on this is essentially very, very simple. You're going to swab the inner cheek uh, and uh, with the tip for about 20 to 30 seconds. Uh, and then you're going to go ahead and place the swab into the vial, give it a little twist into there, and then shake this, the tip in the solution. Uh, you're going to dunk it in up and down. Uh, you're not going to be, uh, you know, flicking that everywhere. You want to keep it contained within that, uh, in that vial. And then you're going to go ahead and remove it. You're going to repeat that step four different times until you have enough genetic material collected. Um, and the thing I like is that this can be done in children easily. So this could be done in a child, which very simply by the parent. Exactly. Now with your diagnostic testing, you're going to be able to get your uh, uh, TG uh, FBI dystrophies done with this. So you're going to get a monogenic uh, result. So you're going to get a positive or a negative for these individuals. So this is going to help you with granular lattice, Reese Bucklers, and thio, uh, uh, Benke, excuse me, <laughs> uh, dystrophies. So if you take a look at all the images here, you know, there are two of them here that are not uh, TG FBI dystrophies. And I would challenge some of these individuals who are on the call tonight to say, you know, which one of these, uh, which one of the two, or which two of these is not a, uh, a TGFBI dystrophy. Uh, and what we can find here is if we go ahead and give us a click, uh, the bottom left is not, those are uh, stellate lesions, uh, which actually have an unknown etology. We did not find anything related to them. So we are assuming that it is caused by an infection that the child had way back when they were younger. Um, and the second one, if we go ahead and click that, that's our uh, favorite patient. So um, if we move forward, 
in uh, keratoconus, we have primary ectasia. This is a polygenic risk score, right? So we're going to say this individual is at low or high risk. And what we're going to do in this is we're going to go ahead and use this to aid in our management. How often are we going to follow up on these individuals? And are we going to, or rather, what this test will do is if we have a high genetic risk, it's going to lower our threshold for referral and treatment with corneal collagen cross linking, right? You may say that based on the, uh, you know, the, uh, the outline, uh, or rather the parameters outlined in the, uh, the uh, US uh, FDA clinical trial data that you want to have at least a diopter progression to say that it is true progression in an uh, individual with KC, right? But I'd have a much lower threshold for sending that individual out knowing that they're at a high risk and they have a presentation like what we see here. Now for this individual, if we go ahead and give one more click, you know, that's a questionable cornea. If all I have is a corneal topography, you know, some individuals might say, ah, eh, it looks normal, we're good. Uh, when in fact, this individual actually is not normal at all. You can see that they ended up progressing to having that level of keratoconus that you can see on that upper right before we went ahead and cross-linked them and they lost some vision with that. They were no longer correctable to a solid 2020. So had we have been able to follow this individual, and you'll notice the dates between the two of that, that's two years of time that elapsed between those two visits. We would have never let that happen had we have known this individual had a high risk for keratoconus. So that's uh, something where we could have prevented the change. We could have caught it early, treated it early, and saved the vision for the individual. And the genetic testing would have caused that. So, John, yesterday I spoke with a patient. So she's a 44-year-old with keratoconus. She's had a corneal transplant in one eye many years ago, and she has significant corneal scarring in the other eye. And we were talking about genetic testing, and I we were talking about her 12-year-old daughter, who is actually the same age as one of my kids, who's 12 too. And I said, you know, I, I've never actually seen the daughter, but I said, we have this genetic test. We can actually test her now. And then we talked about corneal collagen cross-linking if needed. And her response was, so we would never have to go here where I am today. And I said, that that's correct. You know, we could actually treat her early. If she indeed was at high risk, we can definitely treat her early to prevent everything that you've gone through. And we know that keratoconus really impacts quality of life, but it's also a huge economic burden for our patients. And just having that discussion with her, she was so excited. Like, this is fantastic that you're telling me about this information to so we're going to screen her daughter and get her tested. So just to prevent any sort of vision loss and really improve patients' quality of life for their whole entire lives. Perfect. Excellent, guys. Well, we have a couple more slides here, but I think we're running out of time. What we'll do is we'll kind of fast forward to the most important slide on this. You know, best practices. We don't want to be throwing darts at a board. We want to be able to you know, pick the areas that we want to test. The necessities in this, if you're going to do it, is to have the genetic counselor involved. They have to be involved. You don't want to be the one you know, running that sort of advice for these individuals. They're going to cover all of these various different things as far as education, support, and psychological aspects. If we continue forward, genetic treatments, we're looking at targeted genetic treatments being developed. We'll continue forward here. Uh, early genetic treatment applications looked at, you know, cloning and creating fluorescence and fish and, you know, uh, genetically engineered food. And if we keep going here, uh, we started having genetically produced, um, you know, uh, uh, drugs and treatments. So insulin uh, being uh, genetically engineered for humans, uh, recombinant vaccines. Um, and as we continue forward, we start developing newer and newer techniques to, to uh, edit uh, genetic codes, right? And if we do these genetic corrections, we can then improve the outcomes here. So you have two main types here that are kind of the old school, which is uh, ZNF and Talon. Essentially, these are using, uh, you know, various different uh, sequences to find the binding domains and then make a cut in an area. Uh, ZNF was kind of the, the first one possible. Talon added individual uh, nucleotide uh, matching so that it could be more specific, uh, but still wasn't very 
good. <laughs> if we keep moving forward, we have Cas9, which gets found. And essentially what we get is we get the binding protein here. We find the targeted DNA sequence. We cleave it. We use the guide RNA and we go ahead and we create a new sequence for that area. CRISPR does a good job at this, but it cuts both strands. So it's very good at deletion. It's not super good at insertion. Whereas prime editing, which is the evolution of CRISPR, uh, can do a single strand cut and is very good at replacement. Um, so that pours into the application in uh, uh, inherited retinal diseases and the use of uh, CRISPR for this. Currently, there is a trial going on, which is the Brilliance trial for individuals with uh, liver uh, congenital amaurosis. And uh, what they're finding is they're using a sub, uh, sub retinal injection for this. Uh, uh, basically uh, testing up to three different dose levels for patients from uh, three to uh, 17. What they found in the trial that's been very interesting is an injection in one eye has been improving uh, both eyes. So uh, obviously you're treating the genes, genes are everywhere, you're gonna be treating both eyes. So um, there are some ethical concerns that come up with this, which is, you know, we have a little bit of an ethical conundrum. We can edit the genome we can create some designer babies, we can have cost of treatments that can get out of control so it can worsen health inequalities, and then we can have germline uh, changes. Obviously, we change your germline, that gets passed down for every generation beyond that. So we need to uh, you know, take that approach. And basically, in the summary of all this, the idea here is to have targeted treatments for everybody where we are looking at their genetics to guide the treatments that we are gonna give them to give them precise non-side effect treatment for these individuals. And with that, we'll wrap it up. <laughs> that was a great wrap up, John. <laughs> so we wow. do really- yeah, that, was it. that was amazing. Oh my gosh, I can't believe like how much um, <laughs> information and how much research you guys put into this incredible presentation. And like you guys both said, this is just a small piece of, of the actual puzzle of genetics and it's i mean this is just such a small amount of information compared to what's what's actually out there so thank you both for, for such an incredible presentation